Is that all right? Okay, thanks very much for coming out to this third installment in our uh, Humana Vitae lectures. Okay, so my name is Dr. Gavin Kerr, if any of you haven't met me. I work for the Iona Institute, Northern Ireland, okay? My colleague Tracy is here, she's our spokesperson, she works for Iona and I as well. This will be my final installment in this set of lectures. The lectures aren't finished, but this third lecture will be my final installment. And then Tracy's going to come in next week and going to wow us, you know, with the, the final thing about the end of the encyclical where the, uh, the Pope of, at the time made all his prophecies. So we're all looking forward to that. I can sit down and take a break after this. Um, just a wee bit of business before we begin. The first thing is that David here is recording all our talks. We have the first two talks, okay? The first one's up online. The second one's going up online tomorrow. And then this third one, as soon as we get it, it'll go up online. So go on to our YouTube page. Um, subscribe to the page. See all our videos. There's other videos from our conferences as well. And you'll be able to get these talks, okay? Especially if you missed the first few. Uh, like us on Facebook and on Twitter and everything. And if you want, just email us and sign up to our, our mailing list. Uh, the other thing is that a few people asked about making donations to the talks, you know, to help us cover the costs or whatever. If anybody wants to make a donation, just speak to us at the end, okay, and we can get your details and everything. That's not a problem. And then the final thing, it's just a wee technical thing. There's something funny going on with the projector, okay? So we can't get the PowerPoint as a PowerPoint. We still have it up here, okay? So I apologize for the size if it's a wee bit distracting. So, I mean, I think as Father Eddie O'Donnell says, you know, you didn't come here to read, just sit down to listen, okay? But it's there anyway, there's a few nice pictures if you want to go through it. This is for my benefit, okay, because I'll forget all this stuff if it's not up there. Is that okay? Great, right. So this week, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the vision of marriage and the family, which was there in the encyclical, okay? So I mentioned the last time that um, Pope Paul VI, whenever we were looking at the historical context of the encyclical, Pope Paul VI, he had set up the commission, and the commission had recommended, the majority of the commission had recommended that Pope Paul VI change the teaching on contraception in the church, okay? So 63 out of 73 said, like, you need to change this, okay? But Pope Paul VI didn't change it, as we know. He had a very particular uh, vision of married love and the family that he was articulating in Humanae Vitae, one which was informed by his reading of this. Carol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, Love and Responsibility. He was reading this at the time of writing the encyclical, and the thought that um, the then Carl Wojtyla uh, was articulating helped inform him of his account of married love that we saw in last week, in la, in two weeks ago in the last session when we looked at the actual arguments from the encyclical, okay? So there's this whole context of marriage and the family within which the encyclical is articulated, and Pope Paul VI, whilst he was listening to the objections of the majority of the commission, okay, so those who says, look, in order to allow for married love to flourish, in order to allow for responsible parenthood, we need to allow some form of artificial contraception. Pope Paul VI was listening to that, but as we saw the last day, he thought, well, if we actually look at the nature of married love, we can allow for uh, the flourishing of married love, and we can allow for responsible parenthood without going down the line of artificial contraception. And that's what we saw in the last session. We saw what those arguments were. In this session, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look deeper into that vision and see how it's part and parcel of the tradition of the church in thinking about these issues. And that tradition of the church, it's known as the natural law tradition of the church. And John Paul II does something really interesting with it. He focuses it on the person, the nature of the person. And he constantly talks about this personalist norm Okay, so the personalist norm, which has to inform us uh, in all of our moral engagements. If anybody's read Veritatis Splendor, it's a wonderful encyclical. All John Paul II's encyclicals are wonderful. But Veritatis Splendor is the one where he really articulates this personalist norm and how it's the person which, um, and the nature of the person which has to kind of be the principle for our ethical engagement with each other. We're going to look at all of that in this session, and then I'm going to draw it to a close, okay? And that's me done, all right? So you'll be pleased to, you know, you'll be finished with me and then Tracy's in next week. All right, Tracy, no pressure. <laughs> okay. So the per persons and the natural law, this is what we're going to get into first. We're going to start with that and then we're going to go and have a look and see how the natural law tradition envisages married love and the family. And then we're going to see what John Paul II does with that, with his whole personalism. So it's people who get married, needless to say. I mean, that seems like something really trite. 
People get married. Goldfish don't get married, okay? And inanimate objects don't get married. People get married, and it's people who have sex when they get married. So given whatever your account of a person is, you're gonna have a certain view of how people relate to each other. So based on what your vision of the person is, you're gonna articulate how their relations to each other come about. And we're gonna see how that happens by considering two very contrasting accounts of person. Okay, so on the one hand, we're gonna consider what's called the Cartesian account, which comes from a French philosopher called Descartes. We're gonna see what he thinks a person is, and then we're gonna have a look at what's uh, at a position more or less representative of the Catholic account of what a person is. Now, whilst Descartes was a Catholic, his thinking on person was certainly not Catholic at all. And so we're gonna contrast those, and we're gonna see how they lead to contrasting views about marriage and the family. And we're gonna see where the Catholic natural law position comes from in that. All right, so this is Descartes here, if you can see him, if you can kind of see him there, sorry about the size with the PowerPoint. Um, I blame Descartes for everything in philosophy. I really shouldn't, I, I'm kind of, you know, it's a bit bold of me, but I, I, I think more or less a lot of the problems of modern thinking stem from Descartes or a Cartesian way of thinking. And I think it's precisely because of his views about what the person is. There's a bit of conspiracy theory about how Descartes died. Okay, the traditional account of how he died is that he had to go and he had to tutor this queen, I think it was the queen of Switzerland, um, and she liked to get up really early in the morning and Descartes couldn't deal with that, and he caught pneumonia and he died from pneumonia because he had to get up so early in the morning. There is another account of how he died, which is a wee bit more sort of grotesque. You can ask me about it during the questions if you want to ask, you know. It involves Jesuits and conspiracy theory, as all good conspiracy theories do. Okay, so, and Dan Brown didn't come up with it. All right, so, Descartes then. So there's his dates, 1596 to 1650. Um, Descartes held that a person is a mind. That's what a person is, it's a mind. So, if you have a person, you have a mind there in some sort of shape or form. And if you have a mind, well, then that's a person. So personal identity is what's called mental identity. A person is identified with their mind. The mind isn't identical to the body for Descartes. You could have any sort of body you want. You may have no body at all. You could just be a brain and plugged into the matrix. Is that still culturally relevant, the matrix? Yeah, okay, good. Right, so you could be plugged into that and every, this, all of reality could be simulated. Um, you could be a brain in a vat, being you know, poked and prodded to thinking the things that you do. But so long as your mind is in place, you are there. That's Descartes' very famous cogito, I think I am. So as long as I think, I cannot doubt that I exist because I must at least exist in order to be able to think. So what I am is a thinking thing and I am identical with my mind, not this body. And if my mind changes, then I become a different person. So, I don't think the same as I did when I was maybe seven years old. I certainly don't think the same now as I did when I started the wonderful world of philosophy and was actually a Cartesian. I certainly don't think that way at all, okay? On Descartes' account, as my mind changes, I change as a person. I'm not the same person throughout. Needless to say, entities which are unable to think aren't people on this account. So, newborns aren't people. Until you reach the age of reason, you're not really a person. And the preborn aren't people as well. And also the very old, those who are maybe unconscious or severely disabled, they're not people as well. Now that has very serious ethical implications because not only does it justify abortion, if these, if these entities aren't people, well, they don't have any personal dignity, we can kill them. And we've heard that an awful lot. Um, but also at the end of life, if somebody is no longer conscious and not able to think, well, that entity isn't a person anymore, so there's no problem with taking that entity's life. Okay, so Cartesianism and the Cartesian view of a person has all these various implications which are very serious and problematic for contemporary debates, and it has an implication for how we think about how we relate to each other, sexually speaking, as persons. But that's the Cartesian account. Now, the other account, it's by this guy, his name is Boethius. And he was in the, uh, the late fifth century, early sixth century, and he came up with a different account of person, obviously not a different account in relation to Descartes. Descartes was, you know, several centuries later. But um, Boethius has this uh, fundamentally different account, and it arises out of the context of trying to think about the Trinity, okay? 
what is the nature of the Trinity? You know, how can we have, you know, one God as we're committed to, you know, Deuteronomy, Hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one, but at the same time, we seem to have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. How can we think about that? Well, Boethius thinks it through in terms of the person, and in doing so, he uh, gives us a definition of what the person is, and he's more or less the first in the history of thought to give us that. The ancients didn't have a count of the person. The Latin word persona just meant a mask, which you used on stage, you adopted this persona, but it wasn't you. Boethius has to rework that whole notion in order to give us an account of the Trinity, and in doing so gives us this very powerful account of the person. Hmm. Come on in, you're very welcome. I do this, I embarrass people who come in late, I'm sorry. So, what is it to be a person for uh, Boethius? It's something very different. By the way, Boethius died in a very interesting sort of way as well. All these philosophers died really interestingly. Um, you can ask me about that afterwards in the question time as well. Boethius' account of the person, what a person is, a person is a substance of a rational nature. It's something that is rational. So a substance is just a thing, okay? There's a very technical meaning to that, but you can ask me about it afterwards. So it's something that's rational. So to be a person is to be a certain kind of thing. It's to be the kind of thing which is rational as opposed to the kind of thing which is non-rational. So goldfish, they're my favorite example in this respect, goldfish aren't the sorts of things which are rational, whereas persons are the kinds of things which are rational. Um, human beings, well, they're the sorts of things which are rational. So anything which is a human then is a person. And crucially for Boethius, or well, crucially, you know, for, for us who follow this tradition, a human being is a material thing. So to be a person, to be a human person at least, not a divine person, to be a human person means to be made of flesh and bone and all the rest, everything that you come from. So I, as a person, am this body right here, right now. That's what I am, that's what my personhood consists in, as opposed to being the body of a fish or a dog or whatever. Okay, they're not persons because they're made in a different way from me. But I'm put together in a certain way that makes me a person. It doesn't make me Gavin. Okay, personality is something different, but it makes me a person, okay, a particular human person. So for Boethius then, the human person isn't identified with his mind, okay? I'm not a person because I have a mind or I'm able to think or whatever. I'm a person simply because I'm an individual of a certain species, which is human. That applies to the newborn, to the preborn, to those who are alive and kicking right now and able to think or to those who are unconscious and reaching the end of their lives, they're all people because they're all the same kinds of thing throughout their life from the very start to the very end. They remain persons. You can see how they're quite contrasting accounts of what it is to be a person. And on Boethius' account then, if to be a person essentially is to be a bodily thing, then our account of married love and sexuality is gonna be affected in some sort of way. It's gonna involve the body and so we're going to have to have certain accounts of how these bodily persons interact to each other. Whereas on Descartes' account, if to be a person is just to be a mind, then how two persons interact is just on the basis of emotion, feeling, and sentiment. All those mentally sort of things, not bodily things. Whereas when we saw the last day, Pope Paul VI was articulating his vision of marriage and the family in uh, Humanae Vitae, he really did stress the human nature of married love, which involves these, this bodily interaction. Are we okay so far? Yeah, happy enough? Great. I don't see any furrowed brows yet, so I don't know if I'm doing it right or wrong, unless I see a furrowed brow. Now, we have these two contrasting accounts. Okay, now the Boethian account is the Catholic account, more or less, that's the Catholic view of what a person is. And the Cartesian account is not very Catholic. It's difficult to defend Catholic views um, with Descartes in mind. Having said that, we can't all just think, oh, well, I'm Catholic, so I'll go with Boethius. We need some reasons to reject Descartes. So I'm going to give you these quick wee pointers as to what's problematic about Descartes and move on, okay? Because uh, what I want to do is articulate the vision of the person, marriage and everything, uh, which informs Humanae Vitae. So we want to kind of quickly get the Catholic position under our belts. But here's a few problems with um, Descartes' accounts of what it is to be a person. The first and probably the foremost one is that Descartes proofs for the immateriality of the mind, okay, so for his view that the mind is immaterial, it's this immaterial thing, um, they're very problematic. The accounts that he gives of that are very problematic and there's certain issues 
um, which when we're teaching first year philosophy, we always bring out when we try, try to get people to read Descartes, especially in meditation too. So Descartes wrote this book called The Meditations. There's six of them. And in the second one, he gives these demonstrations for the immateriality of the mind. And they're classic examples of philosophical reasoning. And they're even more classic in the fact that it's very easy to sort of poke holes and kind of undermine them at their foundations, okay? So there's problems with his demonstrations for the immateriality of the mind. Doesn't mean Descartes was stupid, okay? Descartes was a genius, all right? So Cartesian geometry, everybody did Cartesian geometry in school, you know, the X, Y coordinates, and that was Descartes came up with that. He was extremely intelligent. I think the best way to approach Descartes is what the famous Thomas de Tiongilson said, is that there's every reason in the world to be a Descartes, there's no reason in the world to be a Cartesian, okay? So <laughs> Descartes was very good, but maybe his philosophy was up the left. Another problem with Descartes' position is that if a person is essentially a mind or a thinking thing, then as soon as you stop thinking, you're no longer a person. Now, maybe this is unproblematic if you don't think the pre-born or the newborn are persons or those who are severely disabled are persons. It becomes a problem as soon as you fall asleep because you will no longer be a person whenever you fall asleep. Or if you're heavily drunk, okay? So maybe some of us have been to university, you know, from time to time and experienced heavy drunkenness before and blackouts, you know, that happens. That's a, uh, you know, a phenomenon that occurs. You cease to be a person on Descartes' account whenever that happens. Um, if you have a severe disability, so people with severe, you know, cognitive disabilities, they, they either are not people or they're less people uh, and so on and so forth. In all these cases, one ceases to be a person and that's a somewhat problematic issue for Descartes because we, you know, unproblematically recognize people who fall asleep as people. They still are people. Um, they're just sleeping and people who are heavily drunk, you know, they still are people and we, we may prefer that they be different people at that time, but, you know, they still are people at that time. People with severe disabilities, cognitive impairments, um, a lot of us would still think, you know, well, these are still people, even though there's something going on there which impairs them, cognitively speaking. So that's an issue for Descartes. Um, he has no credible account of how the mind relates to the body. He thought it was through the pineal gland, but we know that's wrong. He doesn't have any account of that. Um, and he gives no account for how the body can be used to identify people. And here's the main thing, if you're thinking theologically, if a person is simply a mind, then personal immortality, life after death, does not involve the body whatsoever. For somebody to survive death, if you're just identified with your mind, for you to survive death is just for your mind to go on existing, but not for your body. That means no resurrection. The resurrection isn't essential to personal immortality. Uh, and so that's not a Catholic position. This is why Cartesianism isn't uh, considered a Catholic position with regard to personhood. And this feeds into the conspiracy theory with the Jesuits um, as to how Descartes died, um, because Cartesian philosophy is very, you know, really takes you away from a Catholic vision of things. And, you know, the Jesuits, you know, really enforced, you know, Catholic orthodoxy in Europe. So <laughs> the conspiracy is that they have him killed. Okay. Again, not Dan Brown. That's an actual historical conspiracy. That's just the problems with the Cartesian account. But what I want to get into is the natural law what the natural law is, because we always hear about the natural law, uh, especially with regard to Catholic moral thinking. And it's important to actually see, you know, what representative views of the natural law are. Now, always when I'm teaching about the natural law, I always, I always get people, I always get students come in and say, well, look, the natural law is easy. God simply tells us what to do, and we do it. And they say, well, that's what the natural law is, of course. No, no. Whoever is teaching that and whoever is teaching people to teach that needs to stop now because that's not what the natural law is. The natural law is not the view that God tells us what to do and we do it, okay? Disassociate yourselves from that completely, okay? That's known as divine command theory, that God gives the commandment and we do it. The Catholic position, whilst allowed for divine command, you know, we have the Ten Commandments, you know, they are divine commands, the Catholic position also has what's known as the natural law. And in essence, it is the idea that things have natures, things work in a certain way. And when we act in accord with the way things work, we don't try to bend things to our will, but we conform our will to the way things work. We're acting in accord with the law of nature. And thus we're acting in a morally appropriate fashion. It would be morally inappropriate to act contrary to the way things work. 
That's the essence of the natural law. And that doesn't invoke any notions of God telling us what to do or turning, you know, to some sort of revealed source for every issue in morality. There are some issues in morality we do need to turn to a revealed source for, but by and large, we don't need to do that. We can think through moral issues ourselves. And a lot of moral issues can be done on the basis of that, particularly contraception. So whilst the church's uh, rejection of contraception in Humanae Vitae is the rejection of contraception by a religion, it's not on the basis of religious principles. It's on the basis of principles that can be worked out through the natural law, through natural reasoning, and so ought to be heard and ha have a public place for anybody who is a rational individual. They can read through it and they can consider it even if they're not believers. Does that sound appealing at all? Okay, so that's the position I'm articulating. But this is what the natural law is. Whenever we want to reason about something, we have to use what are called principles, okay? And principles are like tools which help us reading. So if you think about a tool, okay, and you're thinking about if you're trying to mine something, so you're trying to mine in the mountain, you need a pickaxe, you need drills, you need hammers, that sort of thing. You can't get very far in mining without these tools. That's what principles are, okay? That's what principles allow us to do. If anybody's done mathematics, if anybody studied Euclid, um, Euclid lays out all these axioms and postulates and definitions, and then he just does geometry from that. They are the principles of mathematical reasoning. When it comes to thinking in general then, okay, when it comes to how we reason in general, the first thing we think about, philosophers say, is being, okay, being. That's something is, it's a funny sort of word, being, we don't use it in English an awful lot, but the only translation of it is being ends. The first thing that we apprehend is that something is. So when you think about coming across a funny sort of situation where you're not too sure what's going on, so think about the first um, visitors to Australia and they came across the platypus, okay? The first thing they asked, what the hell is this, okay? They actually thought that um, somebody had sewn together two animals, a seal and a duck, uh, as a joke, and that's what the platypus was. They didn't actually know what it was, okay? And then they had to do a lot of scientific investigation and actually find out, well, this is actually a species of animal, okay? This is a, a, a mammal, platypus is a mammal, isn't it? Do we have any scientists? No, we don't know, okay? Right, anyway, well, it's some sort of animal. But before all of that, before we could figure out what species it is, what's its nature, and all of that, they were aware that there is something here and now. And all human beings are aware of that. From the earliest ages, children are aware that there's something other than them, a being there. That's the first thing that the intellect conceives, that there is something as opposed to nothing. So the first principle of all thinking then, which emerges from that, is that a thing can't be and not be in respect of the same time and place. <sighs> wow. <laughs> a thing cannot both be and not be in the same respect, the same time and place, precisely because the first thing we come across in our thinking is the reality of things. So that's, that's known as the principle of contradiction, and it's the basis of all rational thought, and it informs all logic, which in turn informs mathematics, which in turn informs an awful lot of other uh, disciplines. So that's the principle by which our intellect engages with things, but our will, okay, when it comes to morality, it's our will is what matters. When we perform moral actions, we will to do something. We say, I'm going to do this rather than that. I'm going to go out and get a job to pay my mortgage rather than go on a life of crime to pay my mortgage. We make decisions, and to do that, we use our will. So what does our will first come across? The will first come... Oh, no, we don't want to shut down. The first thing that reality that the will apprehends is what's known as the good, something that is good. And think about this. Whenever you will something, whenever you decide to do something, you do it because you want to. That's what it is to will something. You do it because you want to. If you didn't perceive what you want to do as good or something worthwhile or something which is choice worthy, why would you will it? You wouldn't will that's with that which you don't think is good. In other words, you wouldn't will what you think is evil. You may think, oh, this is really evil and nasty and I will do this. You're doing it because you think it would be good to do the evil and nasty thing. So the will 
always wills something because it sees it as a good thing to do, a choice-worthy thing to make. And so it's inferred from that that if the good is something that the will always sorts of apprehends primarily, then the first principle of moral reasoning guided by the will is pursue the good and avoid evil. The good is something which is to be pursued and evil is to be avoided. And that's what guides all our moral reasoning. And surprise, surprise, that's the primary principle of the natural law. Seek to do what is good and avoid what is evil. How are we feeling about that? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to get much dissension from that idea. No, I think we should pursue evil and, you know, get rid of the good. No, there's not many in this. We've got a few Nietzscheans in here. Okay. But the very question is, whose good is it that we're talking about here? Who's under the microscope? Okay. So who is having to act in a way that is good? Well, it's the human good. It's human beings. We want to think, what is it to be a good human being? What is it to be a good human person? And in order to do that, we have to consider what the person is. We're back to the nature of the person. Because when I'm thinking about what is good, okay, so um, I'm a guitarist, all right, I play guitar, I play other instruments as well, guitar is one of them, okay. If I've got a good guitar, minimally speaking, there are certain things about the guitar which means it will function well and it'll be a good guitar and I'll be able to play it well. It has to be in tune, it has to be stringed, it has to make noise, all those sorts of things. You can come up with a finite list of things which will indicate whether a guitar is a good one or a bad one. And then after that, it's all aesthetic perception. Some people like distorted guitar, other people like different tunings in their guitar, etc., etc. But fundamentally, there's something about a guitar which makes it a good guitar as opposed to a bad one. It's exactly the same for the human person. There is a nature to all human persons. That's what makes them human. There's a nature to them that if that is perfected, that if that is made complete, if that is fulfilled, then you'll have a good person. And if that's not fulfilled, if that is undermined, well, that's just like de-stringing a guitar or putting the guitar out of tune. The person will be out of tune and they'll not be leading a morally flourishing life. This is the idea behind the natural law. It's seeing human persons as things with natures amongst other things and not just seeing them in terms of having a mind or having some sort of mental attitude then. So we have to think about what the goods are for the human being in general. And since we're going, well, I'm going with Boethius's account of the person and not Descartes' account of the person, we think of the human person in terms of its bodily nature. And there are three different ways in which, or three different kinds of goods that the human person has. There's what's called nutritive goods, the goods of nutrition, uh, animal goods, and rational goods. These are all goods that um, if the human person obtains them and gets a hold of them, um, it will be living a good life. So nutritive goods, the human person shares with all living things. It's essential for a living thing to take in nutrition to stay alive, okay? So because of cell division, if you don't take in nutrition from your environment, you'll not be able to replace the cells that are lost and you'll die. So, and we know that if things can't get nourishment, they'll, ju they'll just die, um, they starve. The animal goods, it shares with other animals, all their non-rational animals, and the rational goods the human person has only of itself, okay? That's unique to humans, until we find some other rational species out there in the universe somewhere, okay? So what are the goods then in these levels? Well, nutritious goods are nutrition, basically. Um, seek nutrition appropriate to your one's bodily nature. Don't destroy your bodily nature with too much food. Don't destroy it with too little food, but seek the balance. Don't eat poison. Okay, if you were to eat poison, that's not going to help your flourishing at all. Okay, you will not flourish if you have poison. Our animal goods satisfy your animal appetites. So we have all sorts of animal appetites for shelter, for a mate, for a family. Satisfy those and we'll be leading a flourishing life. And we have rational goods where we seek the truth to perfect ourselves and we seek various skills necessary for living in a social community. And if we pursue all that, then the natural law tradition and morality holds that we're leading a flourishing human life. We're leading a good life. And that's, by and large, representative of the Catholic view in morality is the natural law tradition, that there are various goods that human beings have, that if they're followed, um, the, the human being will lead a good human life. And this is where marriage, sex, and contraception come in. This is where the church um, devises its views on marriage, sex, and contraception. With the aid of revelation, yes, of course, because we, as we saw in the Bible, various things are said about contraception and about sex and marriage, uh, but also from the natural law tradition as well. So what we're going to see is that this natural law tradition that we have been looking at, in fact, 
affirms or confirms what Pope Paul VI devised in Humanae Vitae. And we'll see that uh, Pope Paul VI is clearly within the tradition of the church in this respect. Hmm. So marriage then. Marriage is a kind of relationship that brings about unity. The married couple are united, as we saw at the last session. So they're brought together and they're made one. The two are one. Um, and so the married couple represent the unit and they're recognized as a unit, not only in law, but within society as well. They're the basic unit of society. So to be married, the couple have to be united in some way. And that unity then is going to have to be bodily because the two persons which are united together aren't two minds which are coming together. I like you and you like me and we have these sentiments for each other. You can have that for anybody. You can have that with your dog. Okay, your dog can be, you know, sort of have sentiments for you. My dog does, even though he's stupid. And he's not stupid because he likes me. Um, and <laughs> I like him and we have this, you know, sentimental connection, but we're not married. Okay, we're not married. Despite, I mean, what some people may feel like, and we all know them, those, you know, people who aren't married and have a dog and the dog seems to be their husband or wife. Okay, and we know people like that. They're not married just because they have this sentimental connection to each other. Because the human person is bodily, they're united to another human person through the body. And the way in which human persons are united bodily is through sexual intercourse. It's sexual intercourse which unites two human beings together and makes them one. This is because, as we saw uh, two weeks ago, the sexual organs or the sexual faculty involves organs which are incomplete in themselves and are not brought to completion until they're united with the sexual organs of another human of the opposite sex. So there's a complementarity there. So just to repeat that, the sexual faculty in the human person involves organs which are incomplete in themselves and they don't come to completion in themselves, but come to completion in their connection with the sexual organs of another human body complementary human body of the opposite sex. So sexual intercourse of a mate um, who is of the opposite sex is what unites two individual persons together, not only emotionally, not only sentimentally, but also very real and bodily. And as we saw in Humanae Vitae, the Pope pointed out that not only do our wills have to be joined to each other as husband and wife, I will her good and she wills my good, but the bodies have to be joined together as well. What is at the heart of the married relationship then is that unity in the reproductive act of the sexual faculty. The male sexual organs unite with the female sexual organs and the two become one. And that cements that marriage relationship together. It's at the very heart of it. So marriage is a kind of relationship by which certain goods of human life are brought about. There are certain goods which are had whenever you know the sexual organs are brought to their completion. And then the people that are involved in that sort of relationship, that sort of unity, they're perfected and made complete in each other when they engage in that relationship. Okay, there's something good that happens to them. They obtain some sort of fundamental human good. Sexual intercourse then makes use of the reproductive organs. And so insofar as sex is a reproductive act, even though reproduction may not occur, we saw that when we looked at uh, infertility the last day, um, insofar as sex is a reproductive act, uh, it's an act which unites two individuals together, bodily speaking. If sex is an act which unites these two individuals, the proper context is in a relationship in which two individuals are seen as one or are seen as a unit. So the context in which sex occurs is the context in which you have a relationship where the two are viewed as one, as a unit. And that's the married relationship. The married relationship is that relationship within which the two individuals are seen as one. So the action by which the two are united and brought together as one is the action of a married relationship. So marriage is the proper context in which sex or sexual intercourse occurs. And all this to, to say really is that sex is a good of marriage. It's something good within marriage. And marriage is a relationship by which people are made good. Okay, they're brought to completion and brought to perfection. And if we follow the words of Christ, Christ elevates that to the level of a sacrament, okay? Not only is it a relationship um, by which people are made good, it's a relationship by means of which each individual is brought close to God and salvation occurs, okay, for each individual, along with baptism and, you know, communion and all of that. But it's a way of leading the two individuals to God. It is such a great good as viewed by Christ. Taking this to contraception then, because sex is a reproductive act, um, 
contra contraception embraces a whole set of circumstances by which the typical consequences of that action aren't brought about. They don't come about. Contraception, as we saw the last day, goes right to the very heart of sexual intercourse and changes the very nature of the activity so that the two are disunited. There's no longer a unity between the two. If a barrier method is being used, there is literally a barrier there which is put in place so that the couple are disunited. If it's a hormonal method or sterilization or something like that, there's a barrier insofar as they withhold themselves from each other. They no longer look to unite themselves with each other so that one spouse wills the good of his beloved and she wills the good of her beloved. Rather, what they do is they engage in an activity in which they can get as much pleasure as possible from each other. So they make use of each other, which whilst there may be a lot of sentimentality and emotional interconnection involved, the bodily unity is completely gone there because they're simply using each other and not treating each other as persons as ends in themselves, but as a means to a certain end. So in contraceptive sexual intercourse, as we saw the last day and as we're seeing here, whenever contraceptive sexual intercourse is engaged in, one uses one's partner and does not will the good of one's partner because one's partner is his or her beloved. Rather, one takes one's partner and tries to take everything that one can get from one's partner. The I, the subject, me, is the center of attention rather than the other who's good we need to will. That's, the, that's one of the problems with contraceptive sexual intercourse we saw the last day. And here we see it disunites a couple which are meant to be united in marriage. All of this then goes to show that um, contraception disrupts the unity of the sexual act. And insofar as the proper context of that act is marriage, contraception disrupts the unity of marriage. That was a key point that Paul VI made in Humanae Vitae, the contraception breaks that unity of marriage, the, the unity of marriage just crumbles. So contraception stands in tension to the married relationship, okay? It doesn't have any sort of proper role to play within a married relationship. Uh, what we're seeing here is that the Catholic natural law tradition, which focuses on the good of the person, the good of the human person, envisaged by Boethius as opposed to Descartes, uh, it brings us to the same position that Paul VI arrived at in Humanae Vitae. So Humanae Vitae is fully in line with the natural law tradition of the church, which raises an interesting issue. Why was everybody so surprised whenever it came out? This, is, this has been the tradition of the church and you know the major doctors of the church. Why was everybody so surprised in 1968 when it came out? Well, we saw that the first day, why everybody was so surprised and why they you know, expected a change. But the point to be made is this, any de deviation from Humanae Vitae then is gonna be a deviation from the natural law that natural law tradition of the church. If you deviate from the position of humanae vitae, you are deviating from the natural law. And that is a very difficult position for any Catholic theologian to take. It's gonna be very hard for a Catholic theologian to show how um, a position deviating from the natural law is consistent with the church's teaching on these matters. So it won't just be a development of doctrine. It'll be a complete break away from the doctrine which has been you know, traditional within the church. The focus on the person as the guiding framework for our vision of reality, and particularly relationships and how we interrelate with each other, uh, and in particular with God, is what I want to focus on now at the end in the last many slides. In the last 10 slides, I want to focus on this vision of the person, this personalist norm, because I think the way Pope Paul VI looked at this and then further on into uh, John Paul II, I, I think the way they developed this personalist norm is somewhat prophetic, okay, for the 20th and 21st centuries. Tracy's going to be talking to us next week about the prophecies of Pope Paul VI. I'm going to look more at this vision of the person and why I think it is somewhat prophetic for, you know, us Catholics and Christians engaging with these issues, you know, right now in the 21st century. And then that'll draw my contribution to an end. He's happy enough about that? Okay, thanks be to God, says some of you. <laughs> right, the person as an object of love. This is a major thing in love and responsibility and throughout the theology of the body. The person is an object of love. It's something that was created to be loved. The person is a rational substance. Okay, so that's the uh, notion of the person that went way, way back to Boethius. As a rational substance, the only relationship uh, that we can have to a person is a relationship of love. That is the only way we can engage with people, is to love them. Um, now, we saw in the last session 
that to love something is to will the good for it. So the only attitude we can have to another person is to will the good um, of that person in the best way that we can. We ought never to will evil for another person and we always need, always need to try and will what is good for the other. Uh, and in doing so, we will love the other. Now, why is this the case? Okay. If I'm a rational substance, I am a rational substance, okay? Uh, then I have an intellect and will. So I can think things through. I can sit down and think them out. That's what having an intellect is, and we've all done that. We're probably doing that right now, unless some of us went to sleep. No, no, don't fret. We can all think things through. And we can will things, okay? So you can we, as rational substances, as persons, we can determine our own ends. We can decide what we want to do. We can decide for A over B. That's how moral activity is engaged in. By choosing A instead of B, I do something right as opposed to doing something wrong. Or by choosing yes as opposed to no, I do something wrong as opposed to doing something right. Okay, that's how moral action occurs, by forming one's ends for oneself. Now, if I as a person am essentially something which can determine my own end, that's what it is for me to be a person, to be able to do that, then to make use of me for another's end is to treat me as something that I'm not. So if I'm something which essentially can determine my end for myself, to be used by somebody else for their end and not my own end treats me as something less than human. It doesn't treat me as the human being that I am. It doesn't treat me as the person that I am because it completely passes over my will and my ability to determine my own ends and subverts me to the ends of somebody else. So no human being then can be used as an instrument for another human being and still be treated as human. You would be treating them inhumanely. A lot of people talk about inhumane treatment to animals. And so I, I remember having a student once saying, but how can you treat an animal inhumanely when they're not human? Why is that a problem? So that's a different issue. Treating another human being inhumanely is passing over their will and using them for your own end rather than considering what their ends are. So. The only way not to treat a human as an instrument is an, of another is to treat the human as an end in himself or herself. So never treat a human as an instrument, always treat him or her as an end. And the only way to do that is to will the good for the other human being. So to will their end, okay, and to allow their ends to come about. To do that is to love the other human person. So if every person has to be treated as an end rather than as a means, and to do that is to will their good for them, every human person ought to be loved. That's the basic fundamental moral principle that the only way in which we can engage with other people is to love them because all persons are ends in themselves and ought never to be treated as means to an end. One of the, uh, one of, one of the most important philosophers who influenced John Paul II in that respect was uh, Immanuel Kant, a German Protestant philosopher, fundamentalist Protestant philosopher, Kant from uh, Königsberg in Prussia. Königsberg's now Kaliningrad in Western Poland. Uh, but from Prussia, never left it his whole life. And he articulated this notion that all humans should be treated as ends and never as means in themselves. And if you read The Theology of the Body, this edition, Man and Woman, He Created Them, big, big essay at the beginning on how Immanuel Kant influenced the thought of John Paul II. Of course, John Paul II was Polish as well. So, you know, Kant was from that part of Poland, you know, well, Western Poland, which I think is now part of Russia, Kaliningrad. Um, so, I mean, everybody's familiar with the work of Kant if they're working in this area. All right, now this, according to John Paul II, this use of people, this violation of the personalist norm, leads to what's called the culture of death. Have you all heard of this, culture of death? Okay. It's a nice saying, and when you get right to the very you know, heart of what the culture of death is, I think it's very profound. The idea here is that a culture wherein you make use of others merely as instruments for your own use or for your own good is a culture of death and just doesn't value anything doesn't place any value in anything at all, and certainly doesn't place any value on the things which ought to be valued, i.e. human persons. This is because, think about when you use something, and when you use it up especially. Whenever something is of use to you, it doesn't have any sort of value in itself which you adore, admire, or love. If it's just something that you use, like a plastic bag or something like that, you don't adore plastic bags unless, I don't know, contemporary art or whatever, but then it's got a value as contemporary art. Um, you merely use it, and once it has exhausted its use, you discard it. 
So anything which is just up for use, once that use is exhausted, it's discarded. So you either use it until it's destroyed or you use it until you just throw it away and get rid of it. So we think about you know, our natural resources, our overuse of natural resources. We hear about that an awful lot. And we think about then the death of the planet. That results in death and you know, the destruction of these natural resources. Think about batteries, for example. We use them until they've served their purpose and then we discard them. Hopefully we recycle them. And that's what we do with batteries. Um, in either case, what you have is death, okay? Nothing has any value anymore. And as soon as everything dies, you move on to the next thing. What about human persons then? If our culture is one which doesn't treat a human person as an end in itself, but simply as a means to an end, then we're just using people. And a culture of use is this culture of death. We use people until we can get as much out of them as we can, and then we discard them. Sometimes we discard them before we can get anything out of them, such as the preborn. Um, sometimes we discard them whenever we feel that they've lived their lives and they don't need to live anymore, such as in euthanasia. That's what the culture of death is. And it's all based on this notion of using another for one's own ends and never treating another as an end in themselves. I think that this personalist norm and the violation of it leading to the culture of death is probably one of the key teachings of John Paul II that can be applied to our modern age. Because I think our modern age, at least in the Western world, exhibits this culture of death entirely. Okay? Because everybody is up for use for everybody else. And the way to break out of that culture of death, this culture of use, is to start seeing the other person as a person of equal value and dignity to oneself and to be treated as an end in oneself. So bear that in mind. I think that's, this is at the heart of a lot of these contemporary social and cultural discussions. The persons aren't seen for the valuable beings that they are, but they're just like, you know, batteries, you know, or natural resources, which can be used up. Actually, we have more respect for natural resources, in a sense, than persons in some cases. This is the personalist norm in any case. We treat others as ends and not as instruments or means to our own ends because I'm not the center of attention. The other person is there to be loved, not to be used by me. So the other person is the center of attention. And the violation of that is our culture of death. So the personalist norm needs to inform all our engagement with the world. And that personalist norm is inf implicit in the natural law tradition of the church. And it's made more and more explicit through Humanae Vitae and through the work of John Paul II. Now, when we introduce contraception into a marriage or into the marriage act, that act ceases to be one in which the partners give themselves to each other totally and freely, treating each other as ends to be loved in themselves. Rather, what contraception does when it enters into the relationship is it makes the other person of use to oneself. So we use the other person when we engage with them with a contraceptive mentality rather than seeing them as the end, uh, ends that they are, our beloveds. So once contraception enters into the heart of a marriage, we violate the, per the personalist norm and then death enters in. Death enters into the marriage right there and then because that's whenever the other is no longer one's beloved, seen as a, an end to be willed in itself and just something to be used for whatever we can get out of it. And so in a way, when we, we're going to be seeing the, uh, the prophecies next week and one of the prophecies is the breakdown of marriages, the climbing in the divorce rates as a result of you know, greater contraceptive use. And it's precisely because if, I can't get, if one can't make use of one's partner anymore, then get rid of one's partner, discard it, because one's partner may as well be dead. They no longer serve a purpose and they no longer have a use. Um, that's the mentality that contraception brings about. Um, okay. Now, this is the end. Last four slides. This is where I want to go a wee bit deeper into this personalistic stuff, because I think not only is a prophetic with regard to some of these social and cultural discussions affecting the Western world. I think it has something to say about our very relationship to God himself. Not only does it say something about our relationships with each other, but it says something about our relationship to God. So can I talk about God for four slides? Is that all right? Hmm. Nobody ever says no when I ask them, can I do this? Okay. Right. A person is a subject. It's not an object. It has a subjective inner life. And this isn't any sort of kind of Cartesian subjective experience. The Cartesian notion of a subject is that I, as a personal subject, exist in this inner sort of box in my mind. There's this private space inside my head or somewhere, and that's me, and that's my subjective life. And all the goings on in there represent me and my subjective life. If we don't adopt that Cartesian approach, 
if we adopt Boethius' approach, the subjective life, the life of the subject, the person, is somewhat different. The person as a rational individual responds to a world. I am part of a world. I don't stand outside of the world. I'm within a world and I have to respond to it as a rational entity. And I do so as a person. And my response to the world then constitutes me as a subject. I am subject from the moment I was born, even actually I'm, I was subject in the womb, to all sorts of influences to which I reacted as a human being. I come into the world and I start developing more and more and more in relation to all these various influences. And that happens continually. You can never leave this world, okay? Well, until you die, basically. You can't leave your experiences of the world. So I have an inner life, which is mine, which is constituted out of all my experiences. I am a person, a rational substance, but I am Gavin because of the entire history of my life my inner experiences which have formed me. My apologies to the Edith Stein fans here, okay? Very much contrary to Edith Stein and her, her position on this. I will admit I am defending the Thomist view, Aquinas' view in that matter. So Edith Stein thinks there is something essential to me as Gavin, which is right there and then in the beginning. I'm saying that I'm a person and then I develop my personality over time. So my apologies to the Steinians. If they want to attack me, they can. Um, so I developed this interiority, a life lived over time as the person I am, and all my thinking is in a response to the world. Now, given that my personal subjectivity, me as a personal subject, the I as personal subject, occurs through relating myself to something other than myself, to something which is other than me. I never exist in isolation. I'm always existing in relation to others. The others, to which I exist in relation, the others that I am related to, in a sense, exhibit my personhood to me. They are like a mirror by which I disassociate myself from them and I realize that I am a self, I am a person living in a world of other things. I can start seeing myself as a person in relation to others. So the others, objects, persons, all of that in the world that I'm related to mirror me back and allow me to see myself as one amongst others. Is that taking root, that idea? That when we're in amongst others, we don't just exist as an atom, we always exist in relation to each other. And so we're constituted as persons in our relationship to each other. And that's gonna be very important now for what follows from this. So just kind of keep that in mind. You're not this wee atom just floating about or like a ball in space. You're this self, which is a self in relation to others. The more I can disassociate myself from others, the more I can be fully myself, the more I can be Gavin, okay? So I can't be identified with any of the objects in this room because they occupy a different place in space and time. So I take on a certain identity in opposition to all of the objects in this room, okay? I can't be identified with any one of them. Yet I can, in a sense, own the objects in this room. I can make use of them. I can know them and will them and act in relation to them. So in a certain way, they can be identified with me. I can have thoughts about them. And the, the identity of these objects can enter into my thinking. So there's a way in which my thoughts can kind of merge with the objects. And I'm not completely disassociated from them. They're not totally other than me. I can still have this relationship to them. So in inanimate objects, non-persons, aren't completely other than me. It is only when I come face to face with another person, which I can never own, okay, which I can never make use of for myself and ought never to make use of for myself, that I am completely other to somebody else. So it's only whenever two persons meet and are related to each other that the person is fully reflected back upon himself or herself. So it's only whenever I enter into relationship with other individual human persons, that I become fully aware of myself within a community of selves. And in marriage, you enter into the deepest sort of personal relationship you can with another human person. And entering into that relationship brings the full identity of the spouses uh, together. So the spouses completely, without owning each other, distinguish themselves for each other, but come together in a unity which constitutes the marriage act. It's all very mystical, isn't it? But 
you can still own and make use of the other person, especially in marriage, in some sort of way. And as far as you can understand them, you can know a lot of things about them, you can will them, you can think about them and all, in the same way as you can think about objects. Unfortunately, persons can treat other persons as objects as opposed to subjects. It is only when I come into contact with another entity which could never be treated as an object by me, an entity I could never treat as an object, which is wholly other, completely, infinitely other than me, and can never be treated as an object by me, that I as a person can be fully reflected and revealed in my full personhood. Remember, because you're only a self in relation to others. So the other, which is completely other than you, okay, totally disassociated from you, will constitute you or reflect back on you like just a clear mirror, your complete selfhood, your complete personhood. And that other, which can never be owned by you or treated as an object by you, is God. God is so infinitely other and completely transcendent from you that you can never own him, you can never fully understand or comprehend him, and you certainly can't will his good. You can only take the good that he wills for you and respond to that. So the human person comes into full relief or full reflection only when it enters into relationship with God. So whilst we're made whole and complete, yes, in our relationships with each other, spouses, friends, all of that, we're only made totally complete or fully complete or perfected when we enter into a relationship with God and we see ourselves as having a certain relationship with God. We can only see ourselves perfectly in a relationship to God because he is so fully other than me. Now, the natural law tradition of the church, its entire focus on the human person, the whole buttressing framework of Humana Vitae, that encyclical, and the role of the personalist thinking of John Paul II, all go to establish that particular truth, which the Old Testament authors, they kind of intimated it, and Christ reveals to us. Man's destiny is not primarily with creatures. Man is not perfected in creatures. He doesn't belong as his final end with creatures, but with God. He was created for love and he was created to be loved. Only in God can the human person be himself or herself. God has to be the human person's primary concern, not creatures. God is our primary concern. Love God with all your mind and all your heart. Does that sound familiar? It's the primary commandment to love God with all your mind and heart. This is where the personalist norm leads us to. Only when we've loved God with all our mind and heart, once we've completely orientated ourselves to God, and we're revealed in our full selfhood and our full personhood, only then can we know ourselves. And it's only when we know ourselves in relation to God can we love our neighbor as ourselves. Because it's only when we know ourselves in relation to God that we can love as we ourselves would like to be loved. And that's why Christ follows up with the next part of the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. You love God with all your mind and all your heart that reveals you to yourself. Then you love your neighbor as yourself, which is, has been revealed. If you don't know yourself as a child of God in relation to God, how can you love your neighbor as a child of God? And that's where the personalist thinking of John Paul II, which through love and responsibility and various other avenues inspired Pope Paul VI in Humanae Vitae, that's where it takes us, right into that intimate relationship with God himself, which Christ commands us to cultivate in his final commandment that he gives to us. So that's what you've got from me. That's the final thing I'm going to give to you. Tracy's going to come in and just, you know, blow us all away next week. Um, I'm available for any sorts of questions that you want to ask, but thanks very much for coming along anyway. Thank you.